Good evening, everyone, and a, uh, a warm welcome to our second uh, Black History Month live Black History Month apologies uh, live webinar. And um, it's a, a warm welcome from myself, Steve Swithies, and uh, we have some uh, fantastic uh, guests and speakers uh, this evening. Um, we're going to be joined by um, Troy Townsend uh, from Kick It Out. Uh, we're going to be joined by Emil Heskey, who's uh, just just working through a couple of um, technical glitches. Emil will be joining us shortly. Um, the first part of our, our webinar this evening will be hosted by uh, Butch Fazal. Um, before we go any further, again, thank you very much for joining us. There'll be some interaction, uh, some other uh, speakers, and, and hopefully some polls and some some opportunities to get uh, engaged. Um, We'll also um, be hearing um, about a couple of really, really exciting initiatives. Um, but, but first of all, we really want to um, talk to our our, our really uh, honoured um, uh, guest speakers. Um, first, going to talk about um, Troy, who's here. Uh, Troy, welcome. Um, Troy, head of development for Kick It Out. Um, uh, many of you will know Troy, um, an absolute um, leader uh, and a, a real. Uh, inspiring um, person who genuinely uh, pushes the boundaries and asks questions around equality and making the game and society uh, a better and fairer place for all. Troy, it's a it's great to have you on board uh, this evening. Thank um, you very much, Dave. Thanks for having me. <laughs> no, it's been great. Always our pleasure. And I hope you're having a, a good uh, Black History Month um, so far. Uh, Butch, um, is it okay if 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 we um, start start with yourself, Butch, and um, Hopefully, uh, Emil will join us shortly. Um, Butch, a warm welcome to this evening. Uh, I know that uh, you, this is your your second one, uh, along with myself. How, how's Black History Month been for you so far, Butch? Steve, it's been it's been fantastic. I think there's there's so much going on at the moment, which is which is great. Um, and a bit like Troy, we you know, and and yourself, Steve, we know that um, it comes around to this time of the month, and 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 everyone has this raised consciousness about um, celebrating. Um, you know some incredible heroes and heroines, um, but also recognizing that um, it's not just about this month; it's about what we do going forward as well. And I think that's really, really important. So, um, you know, I'm really looking forward to uh, this opportunity to speak to Troy and Emil. Um, and uh, I hope, as soon as Emil sorted out his technical glitch and uh, our our backroom staff have sorted that out, we can absolutely get going. But as we've got Troy at the moment, Steve. I'm sure uh, there's there's a few things that I could ask Troy until we get started, but you're the hostess with the mostest, my friend. It's over back to you for for the moment. Brilliant, thank you. So um, yeah, we'll be we'll be talking a little bit more about a couple of fantastic initiatives around the FA's uh, club placement program, and also we'll be introducing you to uh, a fantastic group of people, um, the coaching officers who will be supporting diversity and inclusion across the, across the country, uh, supporting coach development. Uh, particularly uh, engaging and supporting uh, black and Asian coaches. They're part of a, a group of wider coach front officers working um, with John, John Folwell in the grassroots department, um, really talented group of people that really want to make a difference across the whole of football. And we've got some particularly talented individuals working, supporting uh, the PE uh, and teachers uh, particularly. And we've got some fantastic people supporting women and girls development uh, and female coaches and people working in a female pathway which is uh, a great uh, a really exciting uh, opportunity to make a difference so we're going to be giving you a little bit more information on that we're also going to be showing you how to get in contact how to get in touch and like i say we're going to be getting a bit of information from you about where whereabouts you're based and how you'd like to either uh, continue to develop in football or how you'd like to um, get into football through um, some exciting uh, courses that we now have. Um, Butch, I think should we should we perhaps start Absolutely. talking? Sorry, stop, stop. Should we? Shall I stop talking, Butch? Yeah. And uh, we'll perhaps really um, start to. Yeah, we'll get in with Troy, and then and then Emil Emil will join us, Steve. So that's fine. Brilliant. Thank you. Okay. So um, that means I'm the one under pressure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where where I'm sure you won't be, Troy. You've, you've done this a few times. Uh, you'll be more than you'll be more than superb, I'm sure. Um, Troy, uh, welcome first of all. Okay, uh, head of head of development uh, at Kick It Out. Um, Troy, what, let's let's kick off with what what Brit what what Black History Month means to you, my friend. 
Yeah, it's um, a question that um, is tougher than normal, to be totally honest. I, you know, I've been in a, I had a teaching career. I've been through, obviously, travelled through the game in various elements from coaching, um, through having my own little setup, um, and to now working in the administrative part of the game. Um, I, I always was a little bit negative about Black History Month because it, and you know, you said it from the outset, it seemed like, particularly in the educational system, people geared themselves up for this one month. Um, a lot of the talk wasn't about celebration, was, but was about adversity of black people um, and what we had been through to, to reach this stage without really recognising the, the powerful role models that has existed all the way through time. Um, and I, I, I kind of was, was never really given of the period of time because I felt that people were using it to tick a box, if you want me to be totally honest. Um, but I'm telling you now, I recognise this Black History Month this this year round is probably one of the most important we could have um, because of the situation around Black lives, because of the conversations that have been going on throughout the whole summer and the recognition of underrepresentation within football especially. Um, this this month is, is, is powerful. I've seen some powerful content. You guys have produced some powerful content. I've made myself available at every possible opportunity to anybody who wants to learn and that's within the game and that's outside of the game as well um, because that's also learning for me you know conversations that are being had some of them are uncomfortable some of them are amazing and you're helping support people on the journey and also that recognition of celebration and appreciation um, you know of the, of the many many black role models that exist and you know, I think as, as, as black I was going to say young black people then and I just stopped for a minute because I realised my age but you um, <laughs> just an appreciation that we're all on this learning curve as well. So even down to today, you know, there's some figures that have been, uh, have been promoted on other platforms and you look and you think, how comes I never knew about these great black role models in a variety of other sports, you know? So I'm taking this as a, as a real strong, powerful month, but I'm also going to be looking after the month as well, because we cannot stop here. It's not yeah. a one month tick box. Um, it's definitely a look, let's, let's, forget the past and let's really start to promote and push from here on um, and hopefully uh, this black uh, history month will be a real spark for that change about learning about black history and i focus on the educational system as well because i deliver education into the academies the amount of times young players have told me that they they never taught about black history in their own school environment um or they're, they're taught about slavery only um, yeah. It's a massive worry. So there's a bigger picture as to what we want to achieve around Black History Month. But let's so, celebrate. Absolutely. So thanks for that, Troy. That's a really, really good uh, segue into my, pro, uh, my next question around the number of clubs that you go in and you see. And, and I know it's a big, big education piece. But, you know, we, we see a new generation. I think we've called it Young, Gifted and Black because... Mm. You know the the youngsters that are coming through at the moment, um, and and the players in particular, and the black players in in particular. What when you're going around and you're speaking to these um uh, to these young talented players, what what's your key message when it when it comes to this area in particular? First of all, Butch, there's an there's an energy um, that has never been afforded young black people before in an environment. There's an energy of learning. There's an energy of open conversation. Um, there's an energy of understanding. And I think the fact that we have a, an open environment for players to communicate and talk, you know, to talk about their experiences, to learn, um, to understand from a different point of view, for me, it's unbelievable. I don't like to criticise the players of the past because they were never afforded these opportunities, first and foremost. You know, it was play football, get coached, go home. But now there's a real educational system behind the learning of young players. I think the message is about understanding, you know, moving away from just being a player. It's it's that whole human being behind the player. It's that whole you have still have so much to learn, but you can contribute towards your own learning. Um, yeah. And it's about understanding the, the experiences of others, because obviously in such a diverse academy environment from the playing side of things, there'll always be learning for those who have never walked in the shoes of a black or an Asian or a minority ethnic player. So it is about appreciation, appreciating everybody in the environment and, and understanding that we all have different experiences, very similar as you would do to the senior players. We all have similar experiences and about us embracing those experiences and Brilliant. really collective as a team unit. As, 
that that's fantastic troy and and i think you're absolutely right and and it is a new type of player that's coming through um i i know it's emil's uh with us now emil welcome my friend how are you Thank i'm you. glad the technical difficulties have been sorted yeah i'm not great with the computers welcome welcome i'm still yeah. learning Excellent. Look, um, I'm, I'm sure you've met Troy before and Steve Smithies as well. Uh, we've done a we've done a few things together. Emil, um, I, I, I wanted to I asked Troy the question around what Black History Month meant to him. What does it mean to you, Emil? Um, it's, it's again, it's just constant learning, isn't it? Um, I was lucky enough to be um, raised around an, uh, an environment that has sat this school, which was which um, especially within the black community that we we went there on Saturdays and 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 did extracurricular and learned about black history anyway so uh, whether you took that in or not we still learned um I was I was the one that loved the, the football and not so much the academic side mm. but I still when I look back they were key moments for myself um so then but now again it's just about embracing the, the month and and really um highlighting certain things and and um, for us, to, for us all to learn, because again, certain things unless we unless it's highlighted, we won't learn it, and especially when it comes around black black history. Yeah, we we talked to Troy and I talked a little bit about and Steve talked about the fact that yeah, it's fine having it in this month, but it's having that consistency and realizing that you know just like any sort of celebration, um, it, it can't be a moment; it's got to be a movement, and we need to mm -hmm. we need to understand that we need to have that consistency throughout the year as well to continue to recognize not only those that have come uh, before us and of, on, on the shoulders of those giants and you're one of them Emil as so is Troy but we we look forward to the new generation of uh, of player and we we call this uh, webinar young gifted and black because we have a new type of player that's coming through mm -hmm. and um i the, the question i want to ask you is what we're seeing a number of black players breaking through more than ever what, what, first of all, why do you think that is, um, Emil? Well, first and foremost, you've got to look at the talent that is out there. Um, again, we we talk about um, football players being a commodity and we talk about football players go out, going out there and performing. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing this time and time again, especially within our, our black communities, that we, we, we have the ability to do that. Um, and and that, will, that will always shine, shine above everything at times. So we have the talent there. We can't. We're not saying that we. Um, that it, no one's saying that we have, we're ever gifted anything. We we go out there and prove ourselves uh, all all the time. Even from when I was playing, where there wasn't many. But we had to really go out and prove ourselves. And now they're doing it more and more and more. So now with the talent that they've, they, and that will always shine through. So it's great that they're actually doing that and proving themselves and proving a lot of people wrong as well. Yeah, fantastic, and it's it's interesting because it? I want to I want to go on to somebody uh, a young player that um, Marcus Rashford MBE um, absolutely incredible. You know the work that he's done, supplying three million meals for children out of school, raising over two hundred million pound for the charity Fair Share, and you know spectacularly actually changing government policy. Now there's not many that can actually do that, and I I think at somebody who has a raised consciousness like that a new type of role model. Troy, question to you, um, that raised consciousness of the player, uh, of, and in particular black players, to understand these issues, um, it's it's a good sign, isn't it? It's it's an amazing sign. It's a sign that we've been, it's probably been long overdue, but I, I again, I said it earlier, Butch, the likes of Emil when they were playing um, and before Emil, you know, your Cyril Regis's, your... You know, when you go back in history, our stories were never told and never celebrated. Um, and so how do you pick up on someone as being a role model and someone that you want to learn off of? And then all of a sudden, you know, we trickle into the game. Our stories are being told. We're being spoken about in the same kind of light as our white counterparts. And then there's this explosion of, of black players right across the game. You know, captain in England, by the way, winning titles, being at the top echelons of the game but probably still not speaking up and speaking out because the game didn't embrace it. And I'd, I'd like to think now that those black players are learning from the past, um, they're understanding their culture, they're, they're appreciating the environment that has put them on a platform, but absolutely have never forgot where they come from. 
Yeah. And, and I'm not saying that any of the players, you know, from the past forgot where they come from, but there's a bigger platform now. There's a social media platform that can escalate yeah. the voice, you know, and the likes of Marcus and Raheem and, and, and many, many others now are using their platforms for good because everyone sees the social media platforms as a place where there's vile hatred, you know, um, and these guys are showing that the, those platforms can be used for good. I've got to also say well done to the team around Marcus Rashford because no player can do this by themselves. No one can do this journey without having a good set of people around them. One, to keep them on the straight and narrow, but two, also to want mm -hmm. to support any initiative that they want to put in place and make them believe that it, will, it it's going to be well received. So, you know, Mark has taken on the government, something that <laughs> I'm quite sure many of us would like to do in our own time and space. Um, mm -hmm. and, and the way that he's made change because of his experiences. You know, this is something that he's experienced yeah. and he doesn't want another child to, to go through that as well. So absolutely, 2020 has been seen you know, deemed as a real bad year for society and, and for most of us in general. But our young stars are shining through and they're proving um, that there is a space for young people to, to talk and to be heard. Thank you. Cheers, Troy. Absolutely superb. Emil, question to you. Would and Emil Heskey in your day, could you, do you think you would have had the power to change government policy the way Marcus has? Probably not, because again, um, this is one of the things that is 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 brilliant with social media and the platforms we have now, and and um, how we perceive now as well. We we couldn't control the narrative back in the day. So again, it, 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 I think Marcus has done a fantastic thing where you're actually putting you're putting the ball back in their court to actually do something, and if they don't do something, then you've got real problems. So we couldn't, we can't, we couldn't control the, the narrative back then. Now they have the, the platform to do so, and they're using it uh, spectacularly. When you're looking at Marcus, uh, I think Troy, Troy uh, hit the nail on the head. When you go certain, go through certain, certain things yourself, you don't want others to do, to have to go through that. So, how can you change? What can I do? And this is what his team has probably sat down. How can I make change? Because again. This is something I've been through, and I don't want any other kid to go have to go through this sort of thing. So to do that is a is a phenomenal feat, and to really keep pushing it as yeah. well, yeah, no, no, to come up yeah. against against obstacles. But no, I'm not I'm not stopping. I'm going to carry on. Yeah, and also Emil, some of the work that you've done in particular. I mean, look, Emil, the work that you, the the support that you've given us, um, but also um, I, I I noticed that you know I I think it was at Port Vale uh, with some of the players and and speaking to some of the, the the young football as well that mentoring piece that you're doing at the moment as mm -hmm. a as a former player as well um you know and i and i know you do that selflessly um that's got to be helping emil uh, and you know there, there's there's got to be a role there around mentoring especially with senior players like yourself i think so i think so because again the, 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 this is something that um i always say even with senior players that are playing you have a massive, massive role to play for these younger, younger kids, girls, boys coming through, and helping them to navigate and negate the the the, the minefield that they're going to go through. They're going to have problems with uh, mental health. They're going to have problems with financial. They're going to have problems with coaches, managers, ex other players. They've got to be. They've got to feel at ease coming to someone to sit down and talk to them and help them with them at them difficult times because no no one's career just goes up and up and up and up and up and just keeps that and, keep, and keeps going nice. Everyone has hmm. a little bump every now and again. So who do they go to? Who can they go to? Who can they sit down with um, and discuss certain things when 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 the goes it gets a bit tough. How was it for you then, um, Troy? You've got. You, you've got a young man who's actually as a, a player as well with Andros. So did Andros turn to you or did Andros turn to a coach at the club? Uh, how did that work? Were you, were you that, obviously you were the father figure for him. How did that work for, uh, for you as uh, with Andros? I think as, as parents, we always built this system around him that um, one put him at ease, to be totally honest. You know, he, he was released as a, as an eight year old uh, from Arsenal who felt that he wasn't going to be tall enough to play professional football. Um, and I remember him coming home and we just, so doesn't matter. You know, we believed in his ability. Um, we said, go back to your Sunday league club, which was Ridgeway Rovers at the time. Um, go and perform in the same way and an opportunity will come. And people will think, well, he was only eight, but that can have a massive impact if you haven't got, again, the, the right words around you to keep you on the level that you were at that made Arsenal interested. 
So Spurs came in not long afterwards and his journey begun, you know. Um, that journey has many highs, many lows, as Emil has quite rightly said. There was always a safe space at home. And I think that's the thing is that safe space to be able to, to talk, understand or leave your troubles at the door and come in and just be as, as the, the do you know what I mean? The, yeah. the, the son, the, the, the uncle, they're just the, in a, on a human aspect. Um, you know, he had a difficult time at Spurs to start with. And then from under 14s onwards, he flourished. Um, when Chrissy Ramsey, uh, John McDermott, and then came in under 15, sorry, he flourished. And I actually knew he was in good hands. Um, they gave it, he gave them a lot of stick. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? There were challenges there and I understand and appreciate those challenges. But some of this is also about your own development and, and learning. Now, Andrus is a character who actually would listen intently, but but also want to improve all the time. And he and he would. Uh, John McDermott tells a fabulous story about Andrus hiding balls in the bushes. You know, you're supposed to come in, you've done your time, and he's hiding balls in the bushes in the training ground so that when the others have gone in, he sneaks back out with a John Abika, and they go and smash balls into the goal. They work on their finishing. Um, but we always provided that safe space for him to come home, to forget about any issues. Um, but also talk if he needed to talk, you know, and, and that's why I talk about that home environment, that network environment. And, you know, he was still, he was playing professional football and still coming home. You know, so, he was on loan many, many a time. So he's playing professional football and still coming home. And we've been part of that journey all the way through, Butch. That's, that's fantastic. I appreciate that, Troy. So, Emil, if I come back to you and I ask you this question, does the modern player need the modern coach? So do we have... Um, so did you see people that look like you who coached you as well? And and if you did, great. And if you didn't, would that have helped? Um, I didn't. Um, the the I had one from about under under nines. I had Neville Hamilton. Um, at, uh, he's obviously passed away. Um, I had him from under nines to about under twelves, elevens, twelves. Um, which was great because again, you're going. On, I'm going from an environment that I only see black people, especially when I was living when I was in my in my younger days. I only really see black people, and then to go into an environment, you're like, okay. Um, but again, I didn't have um, going from them. I didn't have um, any anyone who really I could resonate with. But again, I I navigated my own way through that system. Me and a friend of mine. And we even sit down to the today and 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 reminisce and and look back and say, how did we actually come through it that we never saw? Because it was do or it was do or die. We just had to. We had to navigate ourselves through it, and we were cool with that. We never, we never once blinked an eye, batted an eyelid at, at, at doing so. But now I think if if you if you look now and you've you've got more, more so maybe one or two more so now in that look more look more like you is it, of course it's going to be better for the system of course it's going to be better for the for the for the child to have people like like that i've been through that whereas my, my kids are now in 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 the academy system and i and they have coaches that look like them that can if anything's going wrong they feel they can more at ease to go and speak to them about something and that's all it's all about brilliant so, Troy, I want to move it on a touch. Um, we look at what's happening in the United States. Uh, we look at what Colin Kaepernick in particular has, has uh, with, with his protest. What, what he's done, done really, I think, is raise the consciousness of sports people right around the world that, you know, modern day issues uh, affect everyone and sport can be a great vehicle to uh, have a platform. Um, do we have a modern day Colin Kaepernick in, in, in football here? And, you know, if they did make a stand, would they be supported? Well, let's first of all remember that Colin was firstly ostracised for taking that knee, for taking that stand against the system. You know, it was deemed wrong. You know, it was against the national anthem, as many saw. They didn't appreciate and understand what he stood for. And I'm not quite sure we really picked up on that and maybe supported him in the manner that he... He needed the support at the time. Obviously, what's happened in the summer has meant that there's been so much more wave of support from all people of all different backgrounds. And I would like to believe that we have those figures now. And, and I'm going to talk about a collective rather than black footballers, Asian footballers, minority ethnic footballers, white footballers. We've seen with the players together, you know, that the, what they've created there for the NHS. 
politics, but also in terms of the Black Lives Matter. The collective is there. People are understanding and appreciating. I identify a Ben Me, you know, after Man City beat Burnley 5 0, coming out and speaking as an ally um, because he wanted the Burnley supporters, those that flew that plane over the Etihad that said White Lives Matter, to understand that at the moment we were talking and the players were getting behind Black Lives, you know. This journey can't be done alone for us. So it, it needs the power of the collective to, to help these kind of conversations along the way, to understand, to learn, to, to be uncomfortable at times, to open up those kind of conversations. And I do believe that if, listen, we haven't got any fans in the stadium at, at the moment, so maybe the, the height of discrimination is not going to be seen at the moment, but only on social media platforms. But when we finally do, um, we've got to say that there probably are going to be issues because there were issues, you know, before lockdown in March. There were a number of issues before lockdown in March. This time around, I do believe the power of the player. I think the players have the power and I think players will be supported right across the board. They're not taking the knee for no reason, for just for the sake of doing it. They're taking the knee as a first and foremost, a stand of solidarity, a stand of unity, a stand of we are together. Um, and I think if there was anything to happen on a football pitch, I don't think there'll be any hesitations now. I wouldn't want to highlight any one single player in that at that moment, but I'd, I'd like to think the collective would do what they believe is right. And I've often been asked a question about walking off the pitch and I feel that if things got bad enough, I do believe players would do that. That uh, really powerful words, Troy. Uh, and Emil, I just want to come to you now. Uh, the knee, symbolic gesture, yes raised awareness yes however for true transformational change the next step has got to be some type of action so we know that a new body has been launched by black coaches along with former and current players tackle racism in football that's football's black coalition it's to get governments to do more to challenge racism while issues of and, and especially issues around underrepresentation. Um, group was uh, was partly inspired by the mls black players for change uh, group as well um is that the way forward, Emil? Well, I think, I think, uh, yes. I think um, at some stage you've got to stand, you got to stand up and 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 create change yourself. Because um, if we kick, if we just keep kicking this can down the down the road, we will be another fifteen years, and we'll be looking back and say, didn't we miss out on another generation of coaches? And we'll just keep saying that. But now someone's got to, I think there's got to be something where you put your foot down and say, no, we need change now. And we need change here, we need change there, we need change there. And then we need to, we need time frames with it. And we need to stick to them time frames. And if you're not sticking to them time frames, we need uh, repercussions. I think everything needs to be done because again, um, if I, if you'd asked me at 16 when I broke in at 17, sorry, uh, uh, if I'd have gone 20, 22 years uh, down, the, down the line and, and, nothing would have been changed I'd have, I'd have, I'd have gone well you're lying no this we've got we need change but we haven't we haven't got any further forward and I and I and I played for 22 years yeah you know so uh, at, at some stage we've got to draw in a line a line in the sand and say nah that's enough let's move forward now how can we actually have change instead of doing uh, I look we all want voluntary uh, and we all want but if voluntary hasn't really got us anywhere has it we still, like I said, we, we uh, all these all these players that I looked up to um, when I was growing up, uh, who I, I would have loved to have seen in in management management roles. I don't see, yeah. and we're still saying this now. We're still saying, oh, we've missed out on generations of black coaches. Oh, we've, oh, oh, unlucky, eh? No, let's see what. We, no, we've got to move forward. Troy, football, football's black coalition um, is. It is that a step forward? It depends who's looking at it. You know, it depends. Some people may see it as a threat. Some people may see the collective of, of black coaches um, as something that will send the game backwards. But like Emil says, you know, I haven't had the experiences of, of the transformation from trying to play into coaching at the highest level. I'm still baffled why we don't see more black players transition, become coaches, become administrators, work within the environment of football so that they can empower the next generation, empower the next generation. It always seems that a generation falls off and then we start right back at the beginning again. Um, and then, you know, we, we work down that circle. Um, it, it's almost been forced on the on, on, on the group because 
like Emil said, nothing's nothing's happened, nothing's changed. You know, the taking of the knee from back in June, end of June. Um, what's changed? What's different? Um, and like you said, we want to see action. And I think this group will probably try and force that through in terms of being recognised, also supporting people and, and bringing an appreciation and understanding there is a good pipeline of talent um, that is out there uh, that wants to be recognised, that is ready, that is able um, mm. and wants to support the game. That's the thing. They want to support mm. the game from my understanding. So why have they been ignored for far too many years to mention? Uh, and and so yeah, we're we're coming to near the end of the first half, and uh, just for those who are viewing, um, this is going to be a game of two halves. Uh, we we started off with obviously talking a little bit about the the new generation of uh, of players that are coming through that have got a raised consciousness that will actually protest. It's Generation Z. It means that you know if they see something that's that's not right, they'll they'll make sure that someone knows about it. I think also what we talked a little bit about was around how that might look like going forward. But, you know, with, with two esteemed guests uh, on on the panel today, um, just before we finish the first half off and I, I, I hand it back over to Steve, Emil, five, over 500 appearances, um, you know, uh, we, we can't gloss over this career. It's been absolutely incredible. 62 caps for England. Uh, and you, you look back at your career now, uh, you know, we stand on, on, on the shoulder of a true giant with you, Emil. Um, if there was one piece of advice you would give our young, gifted and back players uh, of, of this new generation, um, what would it be, my friend? Um, I, I, the, for, for myself, I would say if you get a setback, you can always bounce back. Um, if, you, if you get knocked down seven, you make sure you get up eight. Because we all have setbacks, but we we should never let that define us, and we should never let that stop us from reaching what we potentially can. Fantastic, thanks, Emil. Steve, uh, I think we've reached half time. Um, uh, we are. I'm going to pass it back over to you, Troy and uh, Emil. If you can stay on the line, because in the second half we'll have ten minutes in which uh, the FA are going to talk a little bit about some of the. Um, uh, some of the initiatives that we've got going on and some of the changes that have happened. And then we're going to kick off the second half when it's going to be a QA, and a um, Emil and Troy. We've got a number of questions that are coming through. Uh, so, Steve, over to you, my friend. Thank you, Butch. Oh, that was um, inspiring and, insp and, and really informative, insightful as ever. Um, just, 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 uh, just for me, Butch, just two brilliant speakers um, who, who really, really contextualise, understand the, the the work that's been done and the work that needs to be done. So absolutely brilliant. Um, Butch, actually, it's, it's nice to perhaps talk to you now, Butch, about one of the things that you're 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 working on, Butch, at the moment, which links to um, certainly what Troy and and Emil have talked about, Butch, is how how we perhaps help uh, coaches. Uh, get into the game and, and and make a difference. We've got talented people there, Butch. Yeah. Butch, you've got this this club placement program, which is really exciting, Butch. What what, what, yes. what can you tell us about that? Yeah, absolutely. Twelve clubs, six Premier League clubs. In uh, so we've we've got a club placement. Program. What we found, Steve, was that with a number of the UEFA B bursaries game, we've got a number of qualified coaches. A bit what like Troy and Emil talked about this generation of coaches that are now qualified. But one of the key areas that they're falling down on is that as much as they've got the education, they need the experience and exposure. The club placement program is a season long placement for coaches uh, who are who are black, Asian, minority, ethnic or female uh, to come and apply. Um, and uh, all of the details are on the on the boot room. And it's a real opportunity for coaches now who are UA for B qualified to actually get into a club, have a season long placement, get an understanding of what the club's about and more importantly once the foots their, their foot's in the door they build the trust uh, of those relationships and hopefully they'll go on and also get a role as well steve so applications are still open um i i think they fit uh, they they close on the on on wednesday so if anyone who's a youth ua for b coach out there that's looking for a placement um just go to the boot room site i think you can see it on the screen now and um just look down at uh, one of emil's old clubs on there, Leicester City, and I'm pretty sure that one of Andros's 
clubs that he's been on loan is got to be in there, Troy, because he's had more clubs. <laughs> you're, you're, you're on mute, Troy. <laughs> he's had more clubs than Tiger. I know he has, but don't worry. I know what you mean. He's, he, he, he'll come back. Um, Steve, so, so yeah, really exciting. Really, yeah, really exciting. Very, very exciting. So, so go to the FA's bootroom.com. Um, Butch, I, I know there's some, some other, some other support, we, we, sort of liaison for coaches and clubs, but what, 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 um, what other support is there? So we've got coach development officers now, Steve, uh, which we've never had in the past, not those who are targeted and directed at diversity and inclusion. So we've got eight, CDOs, coach development officers, right ac- across the country. And rather than steal their thunder, I'm, I'm sure we've got a couple who can who can talk a little bit more about the actual programme and where they are. So it'd be great to hear from them now, Steve. Brilliant. Thank you. I think we've got Pav Singh um, from the North East, who represents the North East, and uh, Lawrence Locke um, representing regionally the South West. If, if we'd like to invite uh, Pav and Lawrence to join us, that'd be great, but... Are they are they jumping on? I think yeah, they're yeah, I'm sure they are. Yeah, I'm sure they are. I'm absolutely certain they are. Over to you, Pav and Loz. Loz, are we on? Yeah, you're on, Pav. Off you go. Okay. Uh, good evening, all. Uh, first of all, it's 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 great delight that uh, listening to the views of Troy and Emil. Uh, really empowering uh, and uh, really empowering and inspiring. But just in terms of our work, I'm, I'm delighted to be part of a, a team as a coach development officer and really try to address some of the stubborn inequalities. And just on the next slide, this is some of our next mission. Now, as an organisation, we've recognised these stubborn inequalities and we are really united uh, with the stakeholders in the game. A new four-year strategy will, will help us uh, try address these inequalities. And I'd just like to applaud uh, Butch, Steve, uh, Lucy uh, and John Forwell in, in really putting these strategies together. Uh, so we're all leaders, but they are great leaders. Uh, just in terms of the stubborn inequalities at this moment in time, some of the great insight and lived experience of these communities has highlighted the lack of or probably limited opportunities uh, for our coaches. Uh, Troy mentioned uh, stuff around, you know, we just don't want to be a tick box. And and uh, Emil talked about, you know, we, 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 we just do, do not want to lose another generation. And part of our role, our mission will be uh, to yeah. to create a pipeline of talented, yeah. diverse coaching from all backgrounds and just ensure that we do have a modern-day approach. Um, Loz, are you on, Loz? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, yeah, Loz, do you want to just talk us through uh, just the stuff around uh, the next slide, next bit on encouraging more coaches to step into the game? Yeah, so this is where we're really going into our four-year strategy. So we're really going to personalise and connect learning for everyone that comes onto our courses, but also really being specific about the needs and wants of your journey. Um, So everyone wants to coach. Everyone's got a variety of reasons, whether it be for their communities or their careers. And this is for our team in the DNI space, but also for the women and girls team and the PE officers to really support your journey to make it real specific for your needs moving forward. That also yeah, then links into kind of have what you're going to talk about next. Yeah, thanks for that, Loz. Uh, and the next bit around this modern inclusive approach, uh, there's been a lot of stuff we talked about there, Butch mentioned about the modern day coach. Uh, we, we do need a modern day approach uh, to really develop our coaches. And uh, Loz, you talked about we need to be personal, personalised and connected with our coaches, but we really need to make them the centre stage. We need to harness the digital experience, give them ownership, and OK, we need to address some of the inequalities uh, around uh, digital poverty. But I'm sure as coach development officers with our communities, we could come up with some innovative and creative ways of uh, of meeting the needs of our coaches. Uh, and the most important thing around the modern bit is we really need to make the coaches at, at our core. Brilliant. And then that links into digital first, um, especially now with everything um, being on lockdown and we still need to try and connect with you. So using that digital first approach is that we've got a variety of resources that are are out in the public domain now. So we've got the YouTube channel, we've got the coaching community, but we've also got the FA Playmaker, which is the first kind of stepping stone for you to get into coaching. Um, It's also looking at how we can connect with you through the online community where we can have dialogue with FA members of staff, but also get advice from others around your network as well 
So that's going to move us into kind of the next part. So we want to get some engagement with everyone on the call. Um, so there's going to be a poll that's going to pop up in a, any second now on your screen. So for really, it's just to get give us an understanding of what's on the call. Um, what qualifications have you got? What's your highest one? So if you've not got any qualifications, what, what you want to get started or you're at your coaching journey and you've you've gone quite up the pathway. Thank you. So um, we're just going to talk to you about our regions as well now. So, Pav, do you want to just talk about everyone in the team? Yeah, who we are. Uh, great people make great things happen, and I'm delighted to work in this team. Uh, and just going through this team at the moment, in the north, as you can see, that's myself, who will be covering the northeastern Yorkshire with, with Sarah, who will be working in the northwest. We do have uh, four super regions that are sort of divided into sub regions. And then the West team will be Matt Jones, who will cover the West Midlands, Lawrence Lock uh, on South West. And then the East team will be Lee Brown covering East Midlands with Darren Moss uh, covering East. And that leaves us with, obviously, the South team. Uh, the, the, the mighty Peter Augustine will be covering London with uh, Dan Fenner in the South East. Uh, if you do get time, folks, uh, please take a little shot of that, a screenshot, uh, so you know... Uh, who your coach development officer is. Brilliant. And then I'm just going to talk you through the sub-regions as well. Um, so these are the contact details. So you've got Pav, who will look after kind of the northeast from uh, Northumberland all the way down to West Riding and across. And you've got Sarah, who will kind of really look after the south, uh, the northwest uh, from Manchester across to Liverpool and up to kind of the, the Lake District area. And you've got Matt, my colleague, who's looking after West Midlands and myself, from kind of Barts and Bucks all the way down to Cornwall and up to Devon. So there are contact details there. Please get in touch if you want any support around the club placement programme or um, understanding kind of the coaching community. And then looking at Lee Brown, who's going to look after kind of the east side of the, the country and Darren Moss, who's going to look even further um, into Norfolk and Bedfordshire, for example. And then Danny and Pete, who are going to look after the kind of M4, M25 corridor over to Kent. So, again, another poll that's just going to pop up in a moment. We just want to know where you actually coach, um, just so we can get an understanding of who's on the call and where you're from. Thanks, Pav. Okay, thank you. And then uh, the, the important bit around that is uh, we want to celebrate difference and uh, we'll pass you over to Steve and Butch for some Q&A. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks very much, Pav. Loz, thanks very much. Um, exciting times um, uh, with lots going on and I think hopefully this next four-year strategy will see that we really are going after Black and Asian coaches uh, and it is a targeted approach so it'll be fantastic to see uh, people getting involved um loads of questions coming through want to start with um emil first of all mark for emil asks what do you think we need to do to make sure black history month is sustained all year round um i think this is more of a personal thing i don't think you, <laughs> when you're talking about a, a national thing whether it will be um, all year round but i think this is more of a personal thing to educate yourself um I obviously have books that I, I get my kids to read and etc. That will keep them uh, going all year round. So um, whether whether we take it to, into the curriculum in schools, that's something that possibly could be voted in. Um, that could be a, a, a step forward. But um, I think personally, it should be uh, for up to the individual as well. Troy, same question. Yeah, how do we sustain I'd, it? 
having worked in the educational system for me it's an absolute must that it that it's nailed on for the educational system right across the board uh, particularly from a, a younger level you know from a primary school level um that will bring its challenge in itself um but for me if we're going to uh, educate our young people to appreciate everybody in their environment then it's an absolute must um also as well like emil said you can do your own learning 24 7 seven days a week every month every year google is free so if you want to find something out tap some names into google or tap a little bit of understanding into google educate during your sessions as well so during coaching sessions you can continue you can take some time out to educate during sessions as well or you can get the whatever team that you're working with you know particularly at a youth level in and and, and let them appreciate in a different way you know using different styles and tactics but it, it, it has to be something that i cannot believe we're in 2020 and a lot of people still don't know about the black you know black history and and, and only celebrate it during a month and then we'll absolutely at the end of that month ignore it so you know let's put the focus and onus back on ourselves first of all as educators uh, no matter whether you're a coach or not you're an educator and let's apply that into whatever system that we are going in and and, and challenge your your education environments as well to, to do better around history brilliant and uh just on my, uh, from my perspective i'm i'm listening to um talk sports coming in from the cold at the moment absolutely superb series of uh of, of looking back at the history of uh, of black players as well i know emil you've been involved in that as well Loz, over to you i think there's another question yeah it kind of links really um so question for Troy. This is from uh, john uh Erdsley. Um, do you feel there's an idea that education regarding black history is geared towards black communities? And how can we change this narrative? So you talked about education. Um, you know, what, what can we do in education? I don't think it's geared to, I think it's it's there for everybody. Um, I think when black history, you know, I used to teach in a school, I was a PE teacher, but used to dedicate one of my sessions a week to make sure that the they were trying to find out about you know their role models or try and find new black role models and re do some research and educate it, it depends what, what environment you're in black history is there and meant for everybody and like i said you know people that are that don't look like me they you want them to become allies so you want them to appreciate and understand and learn as well um so for me it, it's out there for everybody to learn as much as they want to do to do so um it i don't think it's geared towards the black person i'm learning as we go along I've learned so many things this month already, um, but I continue to learn all the time. If you're open to learning, you'll learn all the time. If you close your mind on learning, then you'll only learn what you want to learn. Excellent. And um, Emil, any, any thoughts around that question? Sorry, what was the question again? <laughs> so um, do you feel like education, um, do you feel that black history is geared towards the black communities or is it? But it shouldn't be. Um, it possibly is, but it shouldn't be. Again, this, this is for everyone. This is um, to showcase that we that that that. Uh, that uh, I think it was one one of the cricketers who uh, who, who who actually put it out there that uh, Michael Holden. There we go, and he was very yeah. emotional about it when, yeah. when he was talking about the uh, the light bulb. And if you didn't know that you, a lot of the times, if you don't know, you'd think that black people haven't done anything, but we've been key components to actually a lot of things that we use within our household. And we don't even know it. Um, there's a book, uh, um, I think it was, we, we were here first, I think, Robin Walker. He's got a really, really good book. Uh, um, I got, I got several books like my, that my let my kids read and just, and, and constantly just educating them in a sense that, so they understand. Uh, you know what we, we do we do have a history and we do have a, a a long history and a good history that helped us pave the way for where we are now in in society thank you cheers troy oh, cool. Irfan Ali asks uh, what's your current view on underrepresentation of bame coaches within higher positions in professional football clubs is there opportunity and a pathway to succeed at the highest level first to you troy and then over to you emil same question well, first of all, and I, I don't like the term BAME, if you want me to be totally honest. So I, I don't like it. I don't use it. 
Um, and I don't appreciate it because the black coach experience or the black development experience is different to the Asian development experience, is different to the minority ethnic development experience. I know the FA have come out with the reason why they've used it as, a, as an individual. I don't like it. Um, I think particularly for black and Asian people, um, the blockages have always been there. But it was almost as if they're not trusted to be leaders. They're not trusted to be able to, to coach at the highest levels. Um, entry levels are fine. Um, I always talk about, you know, I spoke earlier about that transition from playing to coaching. If we were to see the 33% from the playing side of it transition into a much higher figure than the very low figure that it is at the moment on the coaching side of things, that would inspire more people to want to go and do the job, to, to climb over the barriers, to, to attack the, the difficulties that, that they have been on their journeys um, and believe, like Emil said earlier, that they can achieve. And I think what we've got to do now, and I think we're in a very good space to do that, is empower those people um, who want to coach at the highest levels, but maybe feel that they've been denied opportunity to 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 be open, um, to go and you know to go and talk to people that have been in the industry to get themselves mentored. You know, let let's let's try and meet these battles head on. You know, never have fear of a door that's been closed. Never have fear. Um, because there's always a way around that door. If you haven't got the key, there's always a way around the door. Um, I do feel that it's been a massive battle and challenge, but I think, like I said earlier, the pipeline of talent is there. So let's start progressing that pipeline of talent right through the industry, infiltrate the industry as much as we can. Uh, Emil, 500, yeah. over 500 appearances, 6-2 caps for England. Um, I know that you've got a coaching role at the moment. Um, uh, the transitioning from player from player to coach for you, has it been a smooth one? No, it will never will be. Um, as we've seen time and time again, I don't know why it is. And it's funny because we're on this call now and we have 25% uh, B licence, 10% uh, A licence and pro and pro licence, but they'll still tell us that we don't have enough coaches mm. <laughs> <laughs> with, with the qualifications. Um, there's always an excuse, but again, like I said, we've got to keep pushing and we've got to keep... Um, and probing at the end of the day, we we deserve just as much as anyone else to be to be given the opportunity to even try and and, and pit our wits against the best of the best, and that's what I did on the play, football field. So I should be able to have that same same opportunity uh, in the dugout as well. Um, uh, I've recently, I've just come back from a, a game with the women's, and uh, we we won today. And you know, watch watch Jonathan. Um, Jonathan Morgan um, put himself up against the Liverpool side. Uh, Jonathan, this is the first season that, that, that we're we're professional, but he's 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 gone out there and, and really performed and and we won the game. So it's just about getting them chances and getting yourselves in that foot in the door because I believe we have the talent. I believe we have the know how, but again, there's only there's only a few obstacles in the way which we've got to try and break, break down. Loz, over to you. Thank you. Um... Yeah, question from Danny Fenner, who's one of our uh, newly appointed CDOs. Uh, Troy and Emil, um, apart from organised like 5v5, 7v7 football, uh, what other forms of the game you know, did you play? But also, did you play any other sports growing up that con contributed to your development as a, as a young, young player? I was... um, and then did you do anything different you know, out of school? I know you talked about it in your Saturday schools. Did you do anything that was different, that was unorganised? I, I did um, athletics. I preferred athletics when I was growing up. And then football, athletics is more organised. So football, you could actually go and play with your friends. And I did a lot of that, obviously, just at the park and jumping over into schools and playing there because they had the best pitches. Um, so that was that. And then obviously Sunday Sunday league football was as well. But a lot of it was around the area in the community clubs. So you play in, in the whole little 3v3s, 4v4s. Um, uh, all, all sorts of stuff like that, but a lot of it was unorganised, and I would take what I learnt or what was what I was taught from my um, what's it called centre of excellence, and I'd try it in these unorganised um, uh, uh, settings. Um, I know, but you know, uh, one a, a very very good friend of ours, Mama. Yeah. So, uh, and I think he's on the he's think he's on the line today, yeah. and he used to we used to play always together in like in in the youth centres and. And just you know, you just go and try things. You go and you're going to express yourselves, and and it was great to have that. But a, a lot of that's gone now, where it's a lot, a lot more organised. And 
you're being told to do this and told to do that and told to do it and whereas you don't have freedom of expression sometimes can i just yeah. jump on that for a moment because i think that's really really important that player development piece so um troy uh you know w- w- thinking back to how you played that that unorganized stuff um wasn't that the wasn't that the dream it was wasn't the that really time. you expressing yourself yeah it was the best times you know oh <laughs> You could just pick up a ball and go outside, whether it's in the road, whether it's round the corner and kick it up against the wall, knock on your mate's door. Like Emil says, I'm not going to promote this to anyone, but jump over the school fence, etc., and just play. And if you would just watch the football match on the telly, if you were lucky enough, because I wasn't, I wasn't allowed to watch telly that much, um, you would want to try the things that you'd seen in that, you know, without any someone saying, stop, hold on a minute. No, you're not allowed to do it. You could just go and do it. You know, mm. we had youth clubs. I'm showing my age. We had youth clubs. We had that opportunity just to walk down the park as a, as a teenager, a young teenager, and not worry about being there alone with a group of friends. You know, we're growing up in, in different periods of time now, but I think we had so much access to do different things. I played cricket, athletics, the one thing I wouldn't go near was rugby because, boy, that could hurt sometimes, you know, and I didn't really want to do that. So, But I played sport that absolutely helped my, my, my thought process, my mechanisms in terms of running, my timing in terms of cricket. All of those helped towards the bigger picture of, of me wanting to make it in, in the game, you know. But I think time, during my period of time, things were a lot freer for us and we could I, I'd stayed in, my mum used to come home, I, I could tell you this, my mum used to come home from work at seven o'clock and from school, I used to put the key in the door at 6.55, quickly take my school clothes off and my mum would think I've been there since 3.30. Mm-hmm. I haven't, I've been down the youth club all that time playing sport because that's the thing that gave me so much pleasure. Mm-hmm. So leading on that then, you, you talked about hanging out down the youth club, playing with different people. Um, did you play with people at different ages? So were there older players? All the time. And, and how yeah. did that impact All... your development? Well, it, listen, we well, we had a competitive, close kind of unit of friends. Um, the, the older lads, you always wanted to do a thing or two against them, didn't you? Do yeah. you know what I mean? You always want to show off against them. You always want to show that you're a little bit better than someone that's two years older than you. Yeah, they may have the power and strength, but did they have the the tactical and, and, and ability in that now is to, to, to kind of prove themselves on you. So I used to see it always as a, as a challenge, um, but there was no fear in going into it as well. And I think that helped me when I, I didn't go into the academy environment until I was 14, um, but I had no fear going in there because I'd pitted my wince against players, friends, but they were two and three odd years older than me. And I had no fear. I showed no fear. So that almost broke down the barrier of, making my debut for for Millwall and and playing against Aston Villa and thinking oh my god I've never done this before I just went out there and expressed myself and and enjoyed it I I played with a smile on my face as much as I could um, because I absolutely loved the game of football and I just wanted to to, if I could have played football from the minute I got to school to the end of school I would have done unfortunately in between time you had to learn stuff as well which I wasn't great at. Yeah. The, jo- the joy, the joy, uh, that's why I, I can feel the joy of actually just playing. And that's, you know, everyone listening actually can, can resonate with that. I, we've got a couple more questions. I'm going to, I'm going to jump on the one around from KD who, who asks, why do we not see more back players become coaches? Is it because no one gives them chances or simply blocks them? Uh, um, Emil, I know we've kind of touched on that already, but if you want to give your response to that one and then think, back to you, Lars. I think, I think the the thing is, if you get if you're given a chance, uh, when you go for an interview or where if you get to that stage, um, a lot of the time is is to do with uh, experience, and can you get uh, have you got the experience? If you haven't got the experience, then you don't get the opportunity to take it any further. Um, a lot of the time, we don't have the experience of going into these environments, and they think this is with with the stuff that you're doing, Butch, where you actually then they can put on their CV they've done this um, this yeah. uh, this many years in here and that many years there. And they can show the showcase that they've got experience. Um, uh, a lot of people can't at this moment in time, and then you just get stopped uh, um, more, more or less from the from the get go. I was just going to say to that Bush, I, I I don't want to give away my age here, but I took my first coaching badge at nineteen, um, and basically all you did is you either qualified or you didn't, and then that was it. You you just did what you wanted to do. There was no support network. There was none of this 
and obviously we're in a different era now but there was no kind of like point where you could like have a conversation with coaches or listen to webinars or or be in touch with people that are working within the industry you know you were just either you got your certificate or you didn't and then you were on your journey you know and there was no support system at all so I think the more that you know forget me in this you've got someone there who has represented the country at the highest level and has still been denied opportunity as such in terms of that coaching pathway and journey is now finding his way through now but you know how many years did he finish his career why was there not opportunity when you know he just finished his career but the important thing is just having that network of people now who can support and guide your journey um, through the good times through the bad times because like we've said the playing side is up and down but absolutely the coaching side of it is up and down you know, I didn't want to coach in an academy environment. I just wanted to do my own thing and develop my own players in my own way. I would pluck players from who were being released from the environment and they would come into what I called a safe haven because no one's ability ever goes at that age, you know, but your, your confidence gets knocked. And when your confidence gets knocked, you then question your ability. Mm -hmm. So mine was all about rebuilding that ability to go back and attack the system again. And we can absolutely do that as coaches as well. Lars, final question to the yeah, it kind of kind of links. Um, you know, you're both parents. You, you've both got kids in in, in the football system. So, uh, really great question from Shalene Lindsay. Um, how do we involve our black parents in educating our young black footballers for the future in the football industry? Well, if, I, if you don't mind me coming in, we're doing yeah. that now. Um, yeah. You know, most of my sessions that I deliver into academy clubs, I de deliver into community clubs. Um, and obviously now I'm delivering on these kind of platforms all the time. And it's brilliant because particularly from the ages of nine to 13, uh, the, the young lads are sitting with their mums and dads, you know, one of them or, or whatever. So now for me, this has been, it's been great exposure to, to get the parents to teach and learn with their children. And then what they'll do is they'll come off a webinar with mine and have conversations themselves. Whereas before, maybe there was a fear around having the conversation. Yeah. So, you know, trying to uh, trying to help the understanding throughout the system um, and bring parents into play as well. I do special parent workshops. Um, I, I, it, all, it all helps the bigger picture. And I don't, like I said from the outset, a young player, boy, girl, no matter, no matter who they are, cannot do this journey alone. And the more the parent can understand the playing side of the journey, um, and what their son, their daughter has to go through, the better it will be. So that joined up approach of education is absolutely something that I endorse as much as you can. Emil, la, um, I want to leave the, the, the last words to you. You've got a young, you, you've got a young man, a, a couple actually at City at the moment, young, gifted and black. Um, if that isn't a the best link I've ever heard before. Mm -hmm. Wanted to ask you, Emil, what, you know, if if you were to do a report um, and we brought you forward five years, what would your commentary look like now for your son and the future of these young gifted players? Five years on, 2025, Emil. Well, for them, again, they've had, they've, uh, I think, Troy, you've done a couple of sessions with mine, haven't you? Yeah, I have, yeah. Yeah. So they've had Troy, they've had myself, they've had everyone kind of guiding them and shaping them and getting them to understand. And so they've had the best of both. They've had the best of everything, to be honest with you. Whereas I think it's interesting what Troy's saying about then. I never had no one, no one spoke to my mum and dad, yeah. even when I was playing. Yeah. So the fact that they're getting it now is, is wonderful that you can actually then involve everyone because they're going to need the parents. They're going to need their brothers. They're going to need their, their sisters. They're going to need their, their support mechanism. And it's important that we have this massive, massive support mechanism for these because football is not easy. It's a minefield. It is a minefield at times. And, and it's not easy for these kids to be going through that. I've been, I've been there even from a young age where kids are crying because they've been released. But you need the parents. You need everyone. They need that support mechanism to help them get their way through this because it doesn't stop there. It sh well, it shouldn't stop there. You should be able to ca carry on and navigate this 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 wonderful game. Um, but with the likes of what Troy is doing and you guys are doing here, for the next step, because again, it's not just about the playing side; it's the coaching, then it's the admin, then it's the sports science, 
There's the te technology uh, that I, I, I recently did a, um, a session with this lad on, on, um, on the computer and he's telling me, no, you need to do this, 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 and this and moving these, all these little pieces around. I'm like, I'm just watching him doing it and I'm nodding my head. I haven't got a clue what he's doing. But when he finishes and presses play, it looks great. And it was exactly what I wanted. <laughs> there's, so many, but there's so many different fields within this. It just shouldn't, it's, it's not just the playing side, it's everything. So uh, I, it's great that we, what you're doing, Butch, and everyone's doing within the FA. Troy, well, you know, um, uh, massive, massive respect for what you're doing. And for myself, it's just being the parent there to help these kids get through this. So, yeah. Top man, Emil. Yeah. Absolutely superb. Um, hopefully, Steve's still with us. Um, look, uh, Troy, Emil, not only... I, I regard as, uh, as as colleagues, but true true friends as well. Abs in incredible work that you're both doing, and and I hope that we continue on this path going forward. I'm going to pass you over to Steve to finish us off and give us a little bit of a summary. Steve, wow. you with us, mate? Wow, Butch. Yeah, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Brilliant. Wow, absolutely fantastic. Um, to summarise, I mean, let, let's first start with the the guests, Butch, um, consummate professionals. Um, examples of black excellence, examples of integrity, examples of drive, ambition, um, in, examples of um, humility, uh, and also really, really caring about things that matter. Um, really big message from me uh, in the summary. It, it's more than 12 months. It, it, it's about educating uh, and, and the passion in, in Troy's words around education. And this must be a 12 months. I know, Butch, that you want this to be um, a, a movement, not a moment, and, and and that comes clear from from Emil, comes clear from Troy, from Lars, and from Pat. I love the togetherness, uh, uh, Troy. It reminds me of the African proverb that I, I know that we've spoken about. That if you want to go fast, go go alone. But if you want to go far, Troy, we go together. Uh, and that was really important that that Troy recognises that um, because he's so it, it'll help anybody. Um, you know, kick out is there for everybody. Um, I, I know Troy's there for everybody. Education's there for everybody. And allies, Troy. We talk about allies. It's important that we have allies, and it's important that we have um, shared voices and shared communities. It's important that we look after boys and girls and people with disabilities. Anybody that really wants to fall in love with the game. Um, and I love the stories about just go out and play. The game is the game belongs to everybody. Um, absolutely fantastic, Butch. Um, Thank you, Butch, for, for hosting, sharing. Thank you, um, Loz. Um, fantastic to have you uh, and and Pav. Uh, once again, Emil, Troy, thank you very much. It's been our absolute pleasure. Um, in, in, in wrapping up tonight, I just want to, um, again, thank everybody for joining. I uh, really want to thank um, the behind-the-scenes team of Jake and Chris, Sarah, uh, Matt, um, and all the other supporting team that have helped put this together. Our next webinar on our third of the four in series is, is more than a coach um, on the 21st of October at 7 p.m. And there we've got the guests, um, Quinton Fortune uh, and Jason Roberts. Your host for that evening uh, will be the, the wonderful Peter Gustine, who's also been on standby for us tonight, um, along with Butch. Uh, and and you'll, you'll hopefully get to see some, some more of the coach development team at the FA, which are really trying to make a difference across the sport. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining. Have a, uh, a wonderful evening um, and a, a, a great rest of week and enjoy Black History Month. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Bye bye. Thanks a lot. Take bye -bye. care. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.